Our games come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes they're big, loud, and bombastic, and other times they're small, quiet, and subtle. Sometimes they're small and loud, and sometimes they're big and quiet. There's a wide spectrum of what you can do with the genre. Yoma Wari falls under the small and quiet side of things. There were two little horror games that released on the Vita in 2016, and then the Vita and PS4 in 2017. They were developed by NIS, a short for Nipponichi Software. I'm not incredibly familiar with these guys, but they're most commonly known for Phantom Brave and the Disgaea series. These are two games I've been asked a lot about over the years, and I think the big hurdle for me was one of them being on Vita, right? Like, I've never owned a Vita, I still don't have a Vita, and there was never enough exclusive to the Vita that I wanted to play for me to really warrant purchasing one, right? But luckily, both of the games have seen ports. They've both been on Steam for quite a while now, but it was when I heard they were both being ported to Switch in a collection, that's when I saw my opportunity to finally check these games out. It's not often you see a rating that looks like this, T to M. I think the last time I saw that was on the Metal Gear Solid HD collection. Ooh, it even comes with a pretty hefty manual full of the game's artwork. Wait, hold on. This is not an instruction manual at all. There are no instructions in this whatsoever. It's just artwork and comments from the director. That's that's really nice. I really like it when they have nice little items like this to help sweeten the deal when you're uh, buying physical media. But uh, yeah, let, let's check this out. I've, I've never heard anybody talk about these games uh, other than the fan requests I've gotten. So I actually don't know anything about them. Let's see if they're any good. Alright, let's start with Night Alone. That's the original one that came out in 2016 on the Vita. Uh, no music on the title screen, just this droning ambience. It goes really well with the fog, I gotta say. The game opens with our protagonist taking her dog for a walk in the evening. The game will then quickly teach us how to do basic actions like running and tiptoeing. Press the Y button to toss an item. Alright, on the Wii... Jesus Christ, that caught me off guard, like, man, that was really well timed and everything, like distracting you with a tutorial like that and having this truck come out of nowhere while you're distracted. Oh man, you know what, I remember Portal 2 did something similar, uh, yeah, weird comparison, I know, but uh, uh, towards the end of the game, there's this bouncing cube and a launch pad right before it, so you hit the pad expecting to go forward so you can grab the cube, but since you're distracted by this objective, this task at hand, you're caught totally off guard when it flings you sideways instead. That is one of the best ways you can catch the player off guard, by distracting them with a goal or task, and then betray expectations. Brilliant design, I must say. So our dog is nowhere to be seen after the wreck, nothing but a puddle of blood remains, and after returning home, we don't have the heart to tell her sister what exactly happened, and she ends up going out to look for the dog because of it. Not even just her, but we go out to look for the dog as well, even though like, yeah, that thing's super dead, but it really reminds me of how I would do something similar when I was a child. Even if I knew there was no chance of the outcome I wanted, I would still go out and look for it anyway because at that age I just wasn't good at accepting things yet. I mean like th this was more so things like walking all the way to the store to buy a game that I knew they probably wouldn't have in stock. Nothing quite as heavy as losing a pet. So we set off in search of the dog and our sister and this is where the game really starts up. Exploration is the name of the game here. You'll search each street, corridor, park, forest, for anything that can lead you in the right direction. But of course, there's something that'll make that very challenging. The entire town is overrun with angry spirits that are gonna kill you in an instant. The first time you see one, you get this really cheap jump scare, and I know I've explained my stance on jump scares time and time again over the years. I think they're cheap, and I think they're lazy. You know, just when an image fills the entire screen in an instant and makes a loud sound at you. And look, I know the common argument is that the fear comes from the anticipation of the jump scare, and not the jump scare itself, and while I do agree that is true, I still think you can build anticipation without the heart attack inducing moment that follows. I don't know, I just think there's much better ways to scare the player, and well, that one jump scare is more than forgivable, because Yomawari is very eager to explore other methods. First of all, the atmosphere in this game is fan-freaking-tastic. Everything is hand-painted, and it looks as beautiful as it does desolate and unsettling. 
light is very limited, so you'll have to rely on your flashlight to get a good look at your surroundings, but the icing on the cake is easily the sound design. There's no music in the game whatsoever. Everything is entirely diegetic. That means everything you hear is something that is physically there, whether that's the wind blowing through the trees, the chirping of crickets, perhaps the whispering and moaning of ghosts and the sound of your own heartbeat as spirits draw near. I mean, like, man, like, just listen to this, even just walking past a vending machine. It has this eerie zap to it. Ooh, the way it fades in and out as you pass it by. Man, like, the sound design in this game very much speaks to me as somebody who used to walk home after dark by himself when I was a kid. You know, like, when you're afraid, so every sound is elevated. The games use that Silent Hill ideology when it comes to anticipation, using the sound design to let you know when something's close, but instead of a radio to let you know things are nearby, here it's the character's heartbeat. When you find yourself within close range of a ghost or a spirit or whatever, your heart will start to beat harder, and the closer you get to it, the faster it gets. Now, this probably wouldn't be that effective if you could, you know, just see the enemies. And some enemies you can just see, but for the most part, these spirits are completely invisible. They'll only reveal themselves when your flashlight is aimed directly at them. So now, it becomes this scramble of pointing your flashlight in every which direction to make sure you're not gonna bump into the thing, flicking the right stick back and forth wildly in a panic to desperately scan your environment. This is where the tiptoeing can really come in handy. Not only is it helpful for sneaking past the blind spirits, but it also locks your character into facing a certain direction, so it's pretty easy to keep the flashlight pointed in a desired direction as you walk by. This was integral for this wood segment because these rock guys, uh, you don't want to point the light at them because if you do, they're gonna wake up and they're going to come eat you and you're going to be dead. So I found myself carefully maneuvering around them, making sure I did not point the light in their direction as I turned. You can use the right stick to also tilt the flashlight left and right, so there's a greater degree of control here that really helped out with that. But uh, then I found out you can just hit the minus button to turn the flashlight off, and then I felt like an idiot. Uh, I guess it wasn't all in vain though, you do still need it in that segment to see the invisible enemies, so I guess it wasn't a total waste to keep it on. Since you can't take the enemies out, your goal here is to get past them without them catching you, so you might tiptoe by them, run away from them, or maybe hide behind a sign or a bush until they've gone away. Oh man, the visuals here for hiding are so cool. The enemies are represented by these shapeless red masses, so it's a little bit difficult to read exactly how far away the enemies are with it, so you might have to kind of ballpark it, unless they've gone away entirely, of course. Enemies kill you in one hit, and if that happens, you can be sent all the way back to your house, so you can potentially lose a lot of progress. And I think that's good. It means the stakes are high. This is the first time in a while that I felt this tense in a horror game that did not require the rationing of ammunition and health packs. Instead, you'll be rationing these coins, which you can use at a shrine to make a temporary checkpoint, but about halfway through the game, it starts giving you way too many coins. Towards the end, I had more than I knew what to do with, and because of that, the stakes started to feel considerably lower. The monster designs are pretty freaky, though. The inspiration for yokai mythology is pretty apparent. After playing the crap out of yokai watch years ago, it was pretty easy to forget that these myths were originally intended tended to be scary, and this game is pretty freaking scary. I myself have a hard time getting scared by games these days. I guess it kind of comes with love for the genre, but I actually felt pretty spooked throughout my time with this one. Actually, it reminds me a lot of my experience with Yumei Niki. Both of them are focused entirely on exploration, but I think it's the pacing of the scares that makes it so similar for me. Things are usually just there, and they appear on screen simply as you walk towards them. And I know that sounds simple as hell, right? But it's so much more effective on me than when something runs and screams at you, you know? Like when you have control over the pace entirely and you just don't want to walk around because of it. There were so many moments that had me verbally yell, what the hell was that? at the TV. A lot of things you only see in short glimpses before you can even tell what you're even looking at it's already gone. And other times, it's just there. It doesn't move, and you can approach it and just pray that this vibrating face spider thing isn't going to do something. A lot of stuff in this game does something, but a lot of things don't. 
and that makes it really hard to predict what will and what won't come after you. The game's also really good at nudging you in the right direction without outright telling you exactly where to go. You might see what could be your dog run in a certain direction and from there it's like, oh well, I haven't visited the school yet, uh, yeah, let's try going there. And every time, I found myself going in the intended direction. I also love how the map is slowly hand-drawn as you explore too. Uh, Silent Hill 4 did the same thing. I really like having that every now and then. I feel like it enhances the feeling of discovery, right? Your dog insists aren't going to be the only two things you'll find either. There's tons of collectibles to look for as well. These might be key items like a charm or a spirit cleansing salt or keys, but there's also usable items like rocks that can be tossed to make a distraction. I never really found myself needing these that often though, except this one time where there was no way I was getting past these guys without one. And it was uh, just for another rock. Alright, that, that wasn't a waste of time or anything? At least the salt's pretty helpful. It'll stun an enemy so it can't chase you temporarily, letting you make a swift escape. You need it for this guy here because there's no way you're getting that item without it. Matches can also be used for those rock guys, uh, getting them to flock to it so they're out of the way. You might remember that they run at you because they see your flashlight, right? So, you know, getting them to flock to a light source that isn't coming from you is very helpful. Usable stuff aside, there's also a ton of knickknacks to look for, if you're so inclined. The best part of these is that you can actually see them appear in your bedroom after you've collected them. It really feels like a collection, right? A lot of these are just lying around in nooks and crannies around town, but some of these will be tucked away behind these little side objectives. This could be something as simple as finding a little ghost girl a couple of times in a row before she gives you her doll, or you could be finding a bunch of lost chickens, or you could be sneaking up on this giant uh, Daruma ghost thing and giving it its missing eye before it turns around and kills you. Some things are triggered at total random, too. Uh, one time I followed this cat into a park, and then it turned into this giant demon cat head thing, and I couldn't get it to happen again. I love that random nature. It helps make the game unpredictable. Another weird comparison, but that's the entire reason I loved Dream Emulator in high school. I would play it with friends, and then we'd all have different stories because it's so hard to get the same thing to happen twice. A lot of ghost-like figures actually do not hurt you. I remember seeing this gardening woman stomping around, like, look at this. Oh my god, she's gonna tear me in half if I go over there. But I got to her, and to my surprise, she was completely harmless. This in inconsistency, like the before mentioned inconsistency with enemies doing things and sometimes they don't do anything, it creates uncertainty. And that only helps make the game even scarier because you don't know what's gonna happen. The way the ground vibrates as you walk was a really nice touch too, like it's on a separate layer of reality. It kind of looks like it might be a programming error, you know, just not following the camera as well as the rest of the scenery, but I'm willing to guess that it might have been deliberate just because of how much it helps make me feel anxious. And then again, I have experienced a couple of errors where it loads the wrong map entirely for like a second, so who can say for sure? Once you're done the game, you unlock a free roam mode so you can explore the entire town to your heart's content, looking for any bonuses that you might have missed, if you feel like it. That was really good. Like, I was pretty impressed with that. I mean, like, firstly, it's refreshing to find a game these days that I actually find kind of scary, but uh, secondly, just the gameplay, man. Like, it's totally my thing. I love games entirely about exploration. It's why I love games like Pikmin and, uh, and Yume Nikki. Yeah, that's the one I'd say the game is most comparable to, Yume Nikki. If you like that game, this is a must-play. The game's not terribly long, it only took me about three and a half hours to finish, but if you're the completionist type, you're going to be wandering these streets for hours. Alright, on to Midnight Shadows. Uh, this game is widely the same as the first one, except with more focus on the narrative. While the first game gave you a reason to explore the town, and that was about it, Midnight Shadows has more of an overarching plot with more prominent character development. Instead of a nameless protagonist, we now take control of Haru as she searches the town for her friend Yui. Yui went missing after the two got separated on their way home after watching the fireworks, and yeah, that's pretty much the same plot as before, but this time, there's much more mystery surrounding her disappearance. It's not just a matter of, she's somewhere and I need to find that. Now, it's more so like, why did she disappear? Did she run away? Was she kidnapped? What happened? 
Between every chapter, you'll get to play as Yui, and that usually gives you an idea of what part of the town to search next, but not only do you look around town, but this time there's also levels that take place within a building. I found this one a lot more linear than Night Alone. It's much more clear where to go, usually, and once you're inside, it's just a matter of following through each hallway until you've reached the end. I honestly didn't really care that much for how often the game takes control away from you this time to show a cutscene or whatever. There's a lot of scripted sequences in this one, and most of them are of a similar caliber. Your character stops, looks around, moves a bit, and something scary happens. I don't know, man. There was just times when I really wanted the game just to hurry up and let me play again. And this one recycles a lot of content from the first game, too. You'll see some returning enemies, familiar sprites, and there's even a part where they straight up reuse the factory area. Some of the more scripted scares were also reused as well, and like, they didn't get me this time, obviously, because it's like... Kinda already saw this. There is a lot here that is original over the first game, though. A lot of original sprites and backgrounds, enemies. But since it does reuse a lot, it almost feels like an expanded version of the previous game, rather than a sequel, if that makes sense. Running and tiptoeing work the same, checkpoints are the same, uh, the items pretty much work the same. You can now push and pick up objects, though, which you can do to solve some very basic puzzles. Uh, there's also a new charm mechanic, where you can equip one of several charms that you found to get a small bonus, like being able to sometimes run faster. Yeah, most of these are kind of negligible. I still found myself with way too many coins again, too. There are some new items, though, like the paper airplane. It's kind of like the rock, but it goes much further, though less enemy types seem to be affected by it, so there's kind of a trade-off there. There's also a trash bag that lets you hide in place even when there's no cover around. Uh, really good to use when you're in a pinch, though you can only hold one at a time, and they're kind of hard to come by, so use them only when you really need to. Now, unlike like the first game, this one actually has a bunch of boss battles. You don't really fight them as much as you have to endure a long dodging phase. Sometimes you will interact with some objects in the environment to move the fight along though. Some of these I found a little bit frustrating. Uh, some attacks are a little bit too fast to dodge if you don't already know about them, so some fights I was starting over and over again until I just had it all memorized and then I could just finish it easily. Dying against a boss also doesn't really have very high stakes to it either because there's always a checkpoint right before it, whether that's for better or for worse, I guess. Well, that's up to you, but I felt like it made it less tense. I mean, with how much you might be dying against it because the patterns are so hard to dodge without already knowing about them, it's probably a good thing that there is a checkpoint before it, but honestly, I think I would prefer a better balance where, like, the boss fights were a little bit easier to read, and then also the stakes were still there. That's just me, though. I think the most annoying one for me was this big eyeball thing that chases you just because it's an auto-scroller, so you can't even run at your own pace. You just gotta wait for the screen to slowly move along. I think the general consensus is that people don't really like auto-scrollers that much. I don't really either, unless it's a Mario game, so yeah, I didn't really care for this one. So uh, yeah, some of the boss fights are kind of neat, but a lot of them, I don't know, I just didn't really like them that much. It seems like most things I added to this one was either something that didn't make much of a difference to me, or it was something that I didn't really enjoy as much as the core exploration gameplay. Though I will say that the story takes a pretty nice turn towards the end. It's not so much that it has a really cool twist as much as there's a really cool meta portion of the story that it doesn't really break the fourth wall, it's just, it just reuses a motif in a really powerful way, I felt. Uh, I really don't want to spoil it, but I really want to talk about it too, so here's a spoiler warning. Skip here if you don't want to hear it. I recommend you skip this if you haven't played the game and want to because it's a really cool surprise. You good? Everybody gone? Alright, okay, so, at the very beginning of the game, you have that tutorial. You press R to run, L to tiptoe, A to push and move stuff, yada yada yada. But, it turns out the objects we're interacting with as examples for the game to teach us these things, well, it's Yui in the process of taking her own life. This happens at the very beginning, before we see anything else, so, for the entire game, it's really unclear whether this is a flashback, or a flash forward, or a nightmare sequence, or what until we find out that Yui has in fact been dead the entire game, and we've been chasing her spirit, who's been slowly losing sight of who she even is. At the very end of the game, we stumble upon the area in which Yui did this process, and then, for some reason, the game tells us how to move our character. Like, what are you, what are you doing? We already know that. What are you doing? What are you, what are you talking about? Then it tells us how to run, and how to tiptoe, and... Right here, it started to click with me. I started to clue in. 
Haru's going to take her own life as well. However, it doesn't actually have to be that way. In a moment of revolt, you can refuse to do what this tutorial is telling you to. Stop listening to the game and do what you think is right instead. And then the story moves onward properly to the final area and you can get the real ending. Absolutely brilliant. Ooh, while I didn't really like the story's pacing that much with how much it stops you for a scripted event, I did really love the way it wrapped up. And then once you're done the game, just like the first one, you're then free to roam around the town to look for any collectibles you missed, if you feel like it. I think I like the first one better, honestly. Like, uh, I felt the streets were just more densely packed with spirits and things to be afraid of, and I really liked how the focus was more so on the gameplay and the exploration, but, you know, that's just me. If you're somebody that prefers a more straightforward experience with more focus on the narrative, then you might like the second one more. Both of these games are very similar, so it's a little bit difficult to recommend one over the other. I think it just depends on what kind of person you are and what sort of thing you prefer, but I would absolutely recommend them overall. I don't think it's mandatory to play both per se, but hopping on through at least one of them is easily a worthwhile experience. Also probably worth mentioning is that Midnight Shadows is a little bit longer. Uh, Night Alone took me about three and a half hours to finish, while Midnight Shadows took me around six. Uh, that could be shorter or longer depending on how much you search for the optional stuff though. But uh, yeah, you can get the first one on Vita, Steam, and in the Switch collection, and then the second one's also one of those things, but it's also on PS4. Kind of makes me wonder why they never ported the first one to PS4, if the second one's on Vita and PS4, I don't know why they did that, but either way, both of these games are on a ton of stuff at this point, so it shouldn't be terribly difficult to get cracking at it if you're interested. Uh, yeah, I, I think you could probably view these two games having different focuses more as a strength rather than a weakness, because across these two games, they're bound to please a wider audience, and I hope that maybe you'll like it too. Yo, what's up? Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for sticking with me to the very end here. Most people don't get to the Enslaved, and you did, so that's for you, dude. If you want to hear me and Brady talk about, like, dumb bullshit for an hour, we got a podcast up on Patreon. It's a dollar a month. You can check that out if you want. I always appreciate the support. It helps me pay off my student loans. Yeah, that's about it. See you again later. Goodbye. <laughs>